But uh, there's an old saying that says that those who don't know history are, are doomed to repeat it. Um, another expression says that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And uh, you know, we kind of look around our world today and we see a lot of things that it's kind of like, boy, it just seems like we're, we're doing things that we made mistakes in the past, we're making the same mistakes again, and we're wondering why we don't learn from, from history. You know, in, in my own personal life, I recently uh, uh, had an experience where I didn't learn from someone else's mistake. And so uh, this past Sunday, I'm mowing my lawn, and I whacked my head on this, this crank we have for a basketball hoop right by the driveway. It had nice, it's mostly healed up now, but it had a nice big red mark here. I had to go to work. The one guy at work was calling me Mikhail Gorbachev because I kind of look like that. But um, <laughs> So the, the sad part about it is that two weeks earlier, my wife had run into the same handle. And, you know, when I ran into it, I said, what is this handle doing here? And I took it off and I got it out of the way. You know, why couldn't I have done that when, when she did it? But, you know, I didn't, didn't bother to learn from her, uh, her history there. But anyway, that really has very little to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> Except to say that Christianity is based in history. It's a faith that is based in history. It's not a faith that is made up by human invention, but it is something that has a, a definite past, and God has told us it has a definite future. And so I want to talk about three events today, two in the past and one in the future, and these things help to anchor us and give us an idea of our, our, our trajectory in life. And I think as we really get the big picture in mind, it helps us to see how we should be living our life here today on this earth. You know, and it's a crazy world right now. It seems like every day there's something in the news that's just like, you're just kind of like, wow, you know, I can't believe this is all going on. But uh, we need to keep in mind that God has the big picture in his hands, and he's, he's got a plan in it all. So first... The, uh, the three events I want to talk about are the resurrection, the ascension, and then the second coming of Christ. So first of all, let's look at the resurrection. So if you can open in, in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 20. And I know this is all very familiar, but uh, it's good to, to go through some of these things and really think about them in a historical sense and what they mean for us. So John chapter 20, starting in the first verse, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So the tomb was empty. And this is a, an important historical fact, and, it, and it's interesting to me that even many other religions that try to discredit Christianity don't say that, hey, there was such and so actually found the body, and here's the body. They could never do that, right? I mean, the Jews said that the, you know, the disciples stole the body. That was the, the story that they came up with. And, and others uh, have said that, you know, well, Jesus just revived. You know, he really wasn't dead. And he suddenly revived and gained up enough strength to roll that stone back and escape on his own, which we know is ridiculous. But the bottom line is, the central idea that the tomb was empty is fundamental to what we believe. This is the core of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, if you turn over there, please. And we're going to come back to there later, so you might want to put a, put a mark in 1 Corinthians 15 for later. But Paul gives us a very concise statement of what the gospel is here in 1 Corinthians 15. And looking at uh, verse 3, it says, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, 
most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he also appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one normally born. So, again, Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, appeared to many. Now, obviously, this is central to all that we believe. But let's talk about how this impacts our perspective on our life today and our trajectory in life. So if we put the uh, first point up here. First of all, we should no longer fear death. As we consider these things, we realize that death no longer is our biggest, uh, our biggest concern. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in the slavery by their fear of death. So there's a genuine fear and slavery to that fear that many live under because, you know, we think, wow, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen when I die. Or, you know, as we get older, you start realizing you got less and less years left and you, you really start to fear, well, you know, has my life amounted to anything? What, what's it all about? We don't have to fear that anymore. The second thing, we know that good triumphs over evil. You know, how many times do we see evil in our world and think, wow, how can that go on? But we know that actually God has triumphed over evil. In Colossians 2.15, it says that, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them by the cross. A lot of times I think we underestimate what God accomplished when he died on that cross and rose again. We don't understand the cosmic change that took place at that moment when God said, no longer does the devil have the keys to death. No longer does the penalty of sin guarantee that everyone will be dead forever. Jesus reset the authority structure of the whole universe at that point in time, and he took it and he bought it back with his blood. The third thing, we learn that Jesus rose again on the Feast of First Fruits. So this is kind of an interesting thing. It shows us that we too will be re resurrected. Um, if you ever study the Feast of Israel, the, the, I had real trouble saying this last night. There's too many F's in there. But the Feast of First Fruits was celebrated on the first day of the week after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts after the Passover celebration. You guys know what day that is? So the Passover's here. The first day of the week after the Passover is when you celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. <laughs> what happened on that day when Jesus was uh, on the earth? He rose again. Okay? So Passover is when he was crucified. The first day of the week is Sunday. We think of it as Monday, but it's actually Sunday, right? Jesus rose again on the Feast of First Fruits. I don't think that was by accident. In the Feast of First Fruits, what they did, they, they, it was when the barley harvest was first coming, coming around, so there was just a few that you know, had some fruit on it, and they'd take, take the, a, a small sheaf, which was you know, a few stalks of barley, and the priest would take it before the Lord, and he would have a wave offering, okay? So he'd, he'd present it to God, and, and it was a way of consecrating the harvest to the Lord and thanking him for it. And if that, that, uh, that first uh, offering was accepted, then the whole harvest was accepted. So, Jesus was the first fruit. Do you ever recognize, too, it talks about in Scripture, when he rose again, he didn't rise again alone. It says in Matthew that oh, there was the graves of many righteous men also came, came open on that, that same day, which is kind of a crazy thing. So there was that initial bundle, that initial sheaf of a few that, that rose again, you know, and Lazarus got to take part of that. But one day, all of us are going to be resurrected again. We're going to have a complete assurance that none of us are going to stay in the grave, those of us who are in Christ. Okay, fourth thing. We know that we will have a future physical existence after our resurrection. So go back to 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll skip down to verse 42. It says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. 
It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, this is kind of a, a cool thing. We got to think about this here. When it says a spiritual body, you know, it almost sounds like kind of a, an oxymoron. You know, how can something be spiritual and physical? But it's not really contrasting, you know, physical and spiritual, but it's contrasting what is the essence of that. So if, uh, you know, Jeremy tells me he's got a boat, and I say, what kind of boat is it? He tells me it's a motorboat. I know it's not a boat that's made from a motor, right? It's a boat that's powered by a motor. If someone says they got a sailboat, it's not a, a boat that is made of a big sail, okay? It's a, a boat that is powered by a sail, by wind. So when God, Paul's talking here about a spiritual body, he's talking about a body that is no longer just naturally powered, but a body that is now spiritually powered such that it will never die, it will never be corrupted, it will never have disease, it will never be broken. It's a spiritual body that is, that is powered by, by, by God in a way that will never be, be corrupted again. So, this is an awesome thing. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a bit here. Okay, second event, the ascension. Now, I was thinking about this. I don't remember too many sermons where we talk about the ascension of Christ. It's almost kind of a side event that we sometimes, uh, you know, don't, don't really think a lot about. But uh, there's some important aspects here I want to, want to bring out this morning. First of all, in Matthew 28, 18, which is kind of a familiar scripture. We remember it as part of the, the Great Commission. But at the beginning of that, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So we've got to recognize, again, that when Jesus rose again, all authority was given to him. Now let's go over to the book of Acts, in uh, Acts chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now I'm going to pause there. That's pretty interesting, I think. You know, I don't know exactly what that means, that he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive, you know. I mean, obviously, you can go up and, and, you know, say, hey, look, I'm alive, see? You know, it says he ate before them, you know, and they probably, you know, were saying, wow, what, you know, is that really, how's that working? You know, I don't know, maybe he went up to Peter and, like, picked him up and lifted him up over his head, you know, and said, hey, I'm real, see? Or maybe he went up behind John and gave him a wet willy or something, I don't know. <laughs> but he convinced them that he was really alive, that he had real, real body. It wasn't just a ghost. They weren't just imagining it. They weren't having a group hallucination. He was really alive. Okay. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from his, their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly... Two men dressed in white stood beside him, or beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so first point here, we've got to recognize that Jesus was physically alive. He wasn't just a ghost, and I kind of already brought that up. But, you know, there's a physical existence after resurrection, it's not just a, a spiritual up in the clouds kind of thing. Okay, the second thing we see is that Jesus is the ruler over all authorities. And really, this theme plays out all through the New Testament. I'm going to just pick one in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 19. It says that that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, 
and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. I mean, there's so many superlatives in that. It's like Jesus is so up above everything that you can't even describe it. It's just so far up there. We need to get that picture in mind that Jesus is now exalted. He's the Lord over this whole earth, this whole universe. He's the rightful king of the earth. He just happens to be physically somewhere else. Now, we understand that God is here by his spirit, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a minute here. But Jesus physically rose again. He physically still exists. He's just somewhere else. He's off-site. We think about, you know, when we see things with, uh, you know, different battles going on, how you can have a commander nowadays in this country, and he's commanding a battle over in another country. And they can, they can be involved in that, and they're still in charge, even though they might not be physically present there. The same way, Jesus is physically in command. He's in that command and control position. He's just not physically visible to us. Okay, the third thing, we recognize that Jesus defeated our enemies and has now made the way for freedom to come to all the people of the earth who would receive him. So, remember, we, I read uh, Colossians 2.15. It says that Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, if you remember when Jesus was, was walking the earth and he was driving out demons and the Pharisees said, oh, it's by the power of demons that he drives out demons. And he responded to them and he said in uh, Matthew 12, verse 28, but if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. Now, the possession that Jesus is talking about there, I believe, is all of us. That we were, before that time, in the possession of the enemy. Satan had control over the earth in general. The world was pretty much in darkness. There was the things going on in Israel, and God was, was preparing the way for the Messiah through Israel. But much of the earth was just blanketed in darkness. After that point, Jesus set in motion what we saw in that little video this morning, the whole gospel to the whole world so that all can come to freedom. John, in John 12, 31, Jesus said this. He said, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. So Jesus triumphed over them, and when he ascended into heaven, he had the authority as Lord to free men, all of us, from our bondage to sin, our bondage to death, our bondage to, to you know, the, the kingdom of darkness, so that we can be part of his church, the called out ones, to advance the gospel into all the world. Fourth, we see that we can rest in the finished work of what, what Christ has done. It's cool to think about that when Jesus finished his work, he ascended to heaven, Scripture tells us that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says this, But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So that's kind of cool. Jesus sat down indicating that the work was done. He had accomplished everything that was needed to be accomplished by his death on the cross. Now I know there's the outworking of that in our lives, right? We become a new creation. We're not instantly made perfect. At least I wasn't. Maybe some of you were. But it's like there's a work that takes place where God is changing us from the inside out, from glory to glory. He's making us more and more like him as he works out the holiness that he's put into, into us through his new creation out into our active lives, that the things we see line up with the things that we are. And we see that in the world too, right? 
I mean, we see places, we see pockets where the kingdom of God is residing, a family where king, the king, king is, is honored, and that family is, is glorifying God. And we see other places where a business decides they're going to run their business according to godly principles. So we see that the kingdom of God does influ influence and infect the whole world, but it's not instantaneous, right? Psalm 110 also says this, as the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So this fact that, that Jesus has completed everything really has to make us think differently about what we see in the world. That there is, we have a great king who is reigning right now. We don't have to wait for that reign to come. Look at this in, in Acts chapter 7. You don't have to turn there, but remember when, uh, when Stephen was, was about to be, to be martyred, and he goes on, he basically summarizes the entire Jewish history leading up to the point and saying, and you guys, you've rejected the prophets, you've rejected Christ, and, and you've rejected his salvation. And as he was about to be, be stoned, it says this in verse chapter, Acts 7, 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's kind of cool. Okay, so we know Jesus sat down when he was done with his work, right? It says he, he, he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the, the right hand of the Father. You know, his work on earth was done. But now here's Stephen testifying boldly of the things of who Christ is and it says Jesus is standing. You know, and to me that speaks of the fact that Jesus, even though, you know, he physically isn't present, he is right there. He's aware of what's going on and he's, he's being a part of it. And of course, we know that by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was filling up Stephen with all that that he said, such that his face Shown like an angel, it says. So he was just beaming with the glory of God. And Jesus was advocating for him at the right hand of God. So again, I don't know why, but this just, to me, it's, it's just cool to think about. It says that, that Stephen saw heaven opened up. So it's like he saw into that other dimension, wherever Jesus is, and he saw Jesus physically standing there, seeing what was going on. So when we see things going on in this earth, we know that Jesus isn't so far off that he doesn't know what's going on. We know that he is actually still paying attention. He's closely watching what is happening. Okay, fifth thing. Because of the, Jesus being exalted, he sent the Holy Spirit upon the earth, and with that, the gifts of the Spirit. So Ephesians 4, chapter 7 it says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And this goes on to talk about what we, what we term the fivefold ministry. That God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It also, we, we see in you know, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, the spiritual gifts that have been given. These things all for the work of the ministry, so that we, the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with Jesus as our head, can go into all the world and make disciples and to bring this kingdom of God to bear on this world that we live in. Okay, the third event. The final event we must keep in mind is Jesus' return. So it's kind of interesting how we kind of live between these two bookends. It's like we have behind us, we have what Jesus has accomplished. And the fact that he died on the cross and rose again and ascended into heaven. Ahead of us, we have his, his future return. We know that just as he left, he's going to come back. Remember, the angels said that. They said, just as Jesus went, he's going to come back. He's going to come back physically. He's going to come back visibly. And he's going to make things right on the earth at that time. So turn over to... Uh, Back to 1 Corinthians 15. And one of the things that he's going to do when he, when he returns, he will conquer the final enemy, which is death. 
So we know that Jesus has won the victory over death, but we still see death has its reign at this time. But when Jesus returns, he'll put an end to that. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, it says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. So catch the sequence here. Jesus doesn't start reigning when he returns. He's reigning now. He doesn't start conquering his enemies when he returns. He's conquering them now. Okay? It's only death that is the last enemy to be defeated. And Jesus is in the process of defeating his, his, his enemies. Those things like, you know, darkness and, and anger and, and hatred, all those things. All those things which are enemies of what God is about, what his kingdom is about. He is wanting his church to be a part of spreading that gospel so that those enemies can be defeated. Okay, second thing. He will come to judge the world. And read this this morning um, in Psalm 98, verse 9. It says, Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. So because of the resurrection and our future hope, we have, we have reason to, to live with, with hope and purpose here on the earth because we have confidence. Not only in the fact that Jesus rose again, we're going to rise again, he has a physical existence. We're going to have a physical existence. We know that when we see things on this earth that aren't right, and there's so many things that we look at and we say, how has evil got so much sway at times? How does evil seem to conquer? But we know that God is not unaware of these things. We know that God is not going to let those things pass. There is a day when he will judge the earth, all the world, with righteousness, with equity, with justice. Those who have been evil and done evil will get what God has planned for them. He will judge the world with equity. And this makes the righteous rejoice. We don't want to see evil triumph, right? I mean, you think about some of the, the wickedness that goes on. You know, what rises up in me when I see some of these things is, I want to kill those guys. But you know what? God will take care of it. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, there's a role for justice on the earth. God has put authorities in place so that they can bring order, that they can, can deal with evildoers. But those who apparently get away with it aren't going to. They will have their day of reckoning before the Lord and have to deal with the God of the universe who knows all. There's no lawyer that can get him off of that rap. Okay, third thing. When Jesus returns, he'll usher in a new, physical, uncorrupted kingdom of the earth. So keep your finger in, in 1 Corinthians 15, but then go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is awesome good news. One day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And one thing you'll notice in these passages, they're brought together. 
There's no longer a heaven separated from earth. It talks about them coming together. It talks about the dwelling place of God will be with men. And again, Jesus, right? He's physically alive, right? He's got, he's got some kind of spiritual flesh that's real. It's more real than what we experience right now. He's really alive. He's going to bring that to, to a new earth. And we'll be with him together forever. This is good. You guys all seem so serious. <laughs> this is encouraging. This is where we're headed. And this is my point. Maybe I'm not making my point very clear. So we got behind us all that Christ has done. We got ahead of us what Christ is going to do. So we know that, that when we see all the, the things in between that aren't right, that God is in the process of dealing with it. So death, death is an enemy. You know, I hate it when you're at a, a funeral or whatever and they talk about, well, death is just part of the circle of life. No, it's not. Death is the enemy. It was never intended to be part of this creation. It's the result of the rebellion of man and the curse upon sin. God is going to get rid of that one day. No more death. No more pain. No more crying. No more tears. Jesus himself will wipe everyone away. Okay, fourth thing. What this means now is that our work here in the Lord is not in vain. The things that we do now are linked to the, the things that are to come. You know, we're not living just in existence just to get by, you know, just to get on that rocket ship to leave this evil earth and get out of here, and none of this matters. Somehow, all that this is about has purpose, has meaning, has something to do with eternity. You know, we see what Jesus is doing now. Again, when he sets a person free from sin, that's, that's the kingdom of God coming into that person's life. When you set a person free from their suffering, both physically and spiritually, you're bringing the kingdom of God to that person. Every act of kindness, I believe, has, an, has a purpose and a significance for eternity. Jesus even said, he who gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones will not in any way lose his reward. There is something significant about everything we do in Christ, the smallest thing to the biggest thing. When we, when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, we, we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get to be a part of that. So look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. It says, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Isn't that awesome? The things that we're doing now matter. We have purpose. You know, and again, the world is so confusing right now. I'll be completely honest. It's a confusing world. You don't know what to worry about most. You know, is it, is it terrorism? Is it Russia? Is it, you know, are the things going on in our own streets? But one thing we know for sure is that the kingdom of God is advancing and that the kingdom of God will be victorious. Our king, Jesus, can't be defeated. He's above every power. He's above every, every authority. He's reigning right now. He's asking us, hey, 
take part in what I'm doing here on the earth. Because one day it's going to be complete, but you get to take part in what we're doing right now. And God wants all of us to have that idea that, man, we're not just wandering around here waiting for Jesus to come back. There's good, valuable, meaningful work to do. And all of it is not in vain. I mean, I don't know what, uh, what anybody else thinks about, you know, heaven. And, you know, the Bible is somewhat cloudy as far as what that eternal life is going to consist of, what kind of things we'll be doing. But I was thinking about, you know, how will God use the things that we've done here in eternity? And I was thinking about this the one time, and, and I was thinking of uh, the, the men's challenge ministry that, that Paul Dykeshorn and some of the other men are, are part of, and some ladies too. I should, shouldn't uh, discount their part in that ministry. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, so, so this ministry that, that uh, Paul's involved with helps to, you know, teach men job skills, right? That's a pretty mundane thing, right? Teaches them, you know, here's how you can gain some skills. Here's how you can, you can, can have a resume that presents yourself well. Here's how you deal with an interview so you can get a job. It's a mundane thing, but it's pretty important, right? Because if you don't have a job, you don't have food, you don't have self-respect, there's a lot of things that go with that. But really, this ministry also is about preaching the gospel. They unashamedly preach the gospel continuously. And a number of men have gotten saved through that ministry. So I was thinking about this. Wouldn't it be cool if when Paul gets to heaven in the new kingdom, the new heaven, new earth, and, and Jesus says, hey, Paul, I got a project for you. I want you to do this over here. And these 10 guys over here that got saved through your, your men's challenge ministry that you helped learn how to work, they're going to work with you on this project. And again, I'm just, I'm just kind of making something up in my mind here. But I believe that, you know, the Bible talks about there being responsibility, there being work, there being things in heaven that are based on what we've done here on earth. Wouldn't it be cool to have that opportunity to see what you've done on earth and how it translates into heaven? It just makes me excited to think about all those little things that we do that we sometimes think don't matter, that we think don't get noticed, that we think, you know, is this worth it? Because, you know, sometimes we just feel like the world's just getting worse. But the reality is it's going to keep going to a point where Jesus says, yes, I've accomplished everything I, I, I intend to on this earth, and boom, he's going to bring about the new eternity. And I believe that everything we're doing now is playing a big role in that. So I want you to be encouraged to not lose heart, to not give up, to always remember, put that uh, next slide up there with the, this verse here, to give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So, and let's look forward to what God is doing. Let's not be afraid of the things going on around us, but recognize that even in the midst of all this, God is building his kingdom. You know, I've heard that there are people getting saved in the, in the Middle East at record numbers, which is kind of hard to believe because Christians are being, you know, routed out from places where they have been there for centuries. But yet God can use even horrific circumstances to bring about his glory. Um, I was uh, just, I didn't get a chance to scan this, put this up here, but this is the, that doctor who uh, was working with uh, Samaritan's Purse who had come down with Ebola and, you know, was able to survive that. You know, what a hero, right? This guy went over there working with these, these patients in West Africa, contracted Ebola. Thank God, you know, he, God saved his life. But you know what? That, I'm sure mattered for eternity. So be heroic. You know, be, be willing to stand up and be bold because Jesus is going to stand up for you in your moment of need. You can guarantee that. He's not going to stay seated and say, well, you know, I'm too busy. No, he's, he's paying attention. 
He's interested in what we're doing. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that, uh, God, you are in control of all this. Jesus, we sing about the fact that you are exalted. And you are, God. You are exalted above all authority, all rule, all power. God, you are the supreme being in all creation. And Jesus, I just thank you that uh, you're not far from, from any of us, Lord, and your spirit dwells in us. God, it's amazing that, that you have just such an incredible future planned for us, God. We just look forward to that day. God, we thank you that you have conquered death, that we don't have to fear. We, we, we thank you, Lord, that you promise us a future resurrection with you and, a, and a, just a dwelling with you, God, with no more, no more sorrow or pain or trouble. And God, we just look forward to that day. And Jesus, I pray that you would help us to, to live these days on earth with a sense of purpose, that what we're doing matters for eternity. And God, that you would just fill us up with the power of your spirit to be your witnesses, to boldly proclaim that whole gospel to the whole world. We just ask that these things would, would be done for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you have anything that you would uh, like prayer for, you're invited to come, come down forward and, and we'll, we'll pray for those things. Otherwise, have a great day. And uh, we'll see ya.